हेलो एवरी वन आई एम अक्षता झा फ्रॉम ट्रिपल आई टी हैदराबाद आई वॉज इन ओपन डे लाइट इन टर्न फॉर द समर सो आई वर्कड ऑन अ प्रोजेक्ट ऑन क्रिएटिंग द डेबियन पैकेज फॉर ओपन डे लाइट माई मेंटर्स व डैनल फैरल एंड स्टीफन किट सो आई मूव ऑन टू हाउ आई वर्कड ऑन लाइक वॉट आई डिड इन दिस प्रोजेक्ट सो वाई डू वी नीड डेबियन पैकेजेस सो फॉर ओपन डे लाइट आर पी एम्स ऑलरेडी एग्जिस्ट नाउ this is the pipeline that an rpm follows so rpms are consumed by puppet and ansible which is then consumed by packer like vagrant base um, base boxes and uh, docker containers so there's no such pipeline because there was no dot debs there's no such pipeline that existed puppet open daylight used a tarball for ubuntu like oss so if we have debs it will follow a similar pipeline and it will be easier to maintain and also odl upstream will provide installation options so it's always better to have it in the upstream now uh the debian package that i built is a very simplified packaging format it is reproducible and automated it provides service manager support like systemd and uh, upstart also it makes use of jinja2 and uh, yaml templates so it's basically dynamic we can build dot debs for any of the open daylight versions that are available i can just show you what the vars file looks like yeah so uh, this is the vars file yaml file so here we have the version major version the minor version the patch version so these are the variables that are used that can be used to build a dynamic dot deb package and uh, uh, this dot deb package handles all the dependencies so say for bore on the dependency is java 8 it will be automatically included in that for beryllium is java 7 it will again be included in it so we don't need to install java 8 and java 7 separately uh this is the github repo where uh, the code has been hosted it's in open daylight integration packaging there's a dev folder where we can find the code now uh this is the directory structure of the entire debian packaging so we have a build.py script that uses cache.py and build debian files.py now cache.py uses yaml templates yeah, and uh, decides if all the artifacts that are needed for the open day light are present or not to build the dot deb package if not it basically downloads the dot tar dot zz file if it's already present it will just ignore and build debian files dot py will build all the files that are needed for debian packaging making use of the templates again so here we see that we have templates change log template the control template and the rules template and all the other files these files are made use of by build like build debian files.py makes use of these files and uh, i showed you the yaml file which is all the variables defined in it now to build a dot deb package this is a command that we run we execute the script build.py with the arguments this is the major version this is for the boron release the minor version the patch version and the dot deb version that we want now since i already had the dot tar dot gz file downloaded uh, it says already cached this is what cache.py does then again we i haven't included the entire screenshot but yeah so finally in the end we see that dot deb is being built now after the build there'll be a specialized directory called open daylight which again contains specialized directory for the particular open daylight version so we have say a dot deb for uh, boron release that is 5001 so these are the direct uh, this is the directory structure inside open daylight and inside the specialized directory again we have debian the debian directory which basically contains yeah which basically contains these files so these files have been generated using the templates that i showed earlier so it will be different for different releases of open daylight uh now once 
the dot div has been built. We'll now install open daylight. Now, how do we do that? We'll use, uh, if we built it in our local machine, we can use sudo gdebye uh, to install open daylight along with all its dependencies. And here we see that uh, it's being installed. Also, if we don't want to build it locally, it's been hosted on the OpenSUSE website, build services. So uh, for Debian, uh, for Debian 8.0, we can just add the repository and install it, app get install. And similarly for Ubuntu, we can do the same for different versions of Ubuntu. Now Open Daylight comes with systemd integration. So systemd integration basically helps people to not actually touch the binaries in the bin folder. So we can just start Open Daylight using uh, systemctl start ODL. And uh, when we see the status of Open Daylight, we see that it's active and it's running using just systemd. And uh, we can then SSH into the KRF shell and then run commands on the KRF shell. Now once this is done, if you want to just stop open daylight, you can again use systemd to just stop. You can check whether open daylight is active or not. It says it's active. Now I stop open daylight and then I see that the status is dead inactive, right? So again, a Debian package we build, we install. Now how do we remove? So sudo apt get remove will remove all the folders, all the files, open daylight files. And uh, sudo app get purge will remove all the configuration files as well. So yeah, I think all of us do this very often. Now the benefits of having a .dip package is that uh, OPNFV installers that support Ubuntu-like OSs can use this, can use the upstream tools that are available. So .deb is available upstream. And also, it will be easier to maintain. And the future work of this project, so I've just currently built the .deb project, .deb files. Like, uh, I haven't integrated it yet into Puppet and Ansible. That's what I'll be working on next. And then uh, also uh, provide examples in Vagrant Open Daylight. And uh, yeah. And then make open daylight dot deb available in an official repository. So I think that was my work. Thank you. Good. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so everybody. Uh, so my name is Ching Wong from Clemson University, and uh, my project advisor is Annual from Brocade. And my topic today is REST request load balancer for OpenStack and the three node open daylight cluster deployment. So here is the agenda. So first I will do a quick overview for OpenStack and open daylight. And uh, I'll be talking about open daylight clustering and the problems. So and that will introduce in the solution framework, which includes a REST request emulator, a load balancer, and the three open daylight clustering nodes. And then I will talking about the emulator design. And then I will talk about the load balancer emulation and the summary. And then I will talking about the deployment and load testing. And uh, at the very last, I will give the uh, results and conclusion. Uh, so the background. So the background for uh, basically is OpenStack will working in the front end and Open Daylight will working on the back end. And Open Daylight is actually exposed the northbound REST API to handle the network complexity that moves from the neutron services. And then Open Day, uh, OpenStack just simply send a REST request to the Open Daylight. Uh, that's a big picture. Um, so, and then we need a, uh, uh, then we're talking about open daylight clustering. So one will might argue, so okay, so why we need open daylight clustering? Is that uh, one single open daylight uh, server node is enough? Uh, the answer is no, because if we're considering the scaling, the high availability and data persistence, we do need open daylight clustering. But what is the problem if we do that? So the question then would be, uh, which backend controller node should the OpenStack then talking to? 
because you because you have multiple uh, cluster nodes, right? So to be more specific, then that will be what backend metrics that need to be considered. So we think uh, there are a couple metrics which is like the current workload, the connectivity status, and the service status, and some deep health status. Uh, I will explain more like in a couple minutes. So we think the one possible solution is we need an entity between the open stack and open daylight. And that entity should be able to route requests from open stack to the different open daylight cluster nodes with different weights. And it's able to perform some like node up and down check. And uh, it also need to perform some deep health check using the open daylight uh, health monitor module. That is also the REST API exposed from through the northbound. Uh, also, that entity requires the good performance to handling the REST request, of course. Uh, so here is our solution framework. It basically has three components. One is the REST request emulator that simulates the REST request from the neutron services to the open daylight. And we have three open daylight nodes just to simulate, uh, simulate that clustering uh, mode. And we have a load balancer in between. Okay. And uh, we deploy this really into an all-in-one virtual machine with almost five gigabits uh, memory. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, three open data cl cluster running, like each one running in a Docker container. And a uh, load balancer will run it into a load container as well, a dock container as well. So then uh, we need to design a REST request emulator. Okay, so the goal here is we want to design such a lightweight test framework. So because we, we uh, so OpenStack is be able to send REST requests to the open daylight, of course. But why we don't use that? Because that framework is too heavy. Okay, so people might even like wait for 10 seconds to even to wait for a uh, network status to display. So it's, it's time consuming. So we want, to, uh, we want to have a light test framework to help us to speed up. So that leads to a couple features for the emulator. So one is uh, we want that, as I said before, so then we want the test, the open daylight cluster independent of open stack. Um, so we don't need OpenStack anymore. We just need an uh, emulator to, to generate uh, the REST request to the open daylight. And then we need uh, some like mock object to simulate re requests from the neutron. So for example, if we want to simulate creating networks, if we want to simulate creating subnets, if we want to create, uh, create ports, so each that uh, network operation has uh, different like object to send. So we, we want to simulate that uh, object as the input for the simulator. And then we will perform some heavy load testing to generate traffic to, to the open daylight cluster. Um, and we think some client context may be useful for some deeper performance testing. So when I say client context, what I mean is we want to simulate, okay, is, there is a client trying to simul uh, to create a network, and you got the network UUID. And based on that UUID, you can create multiple subnets. So maybe on one subnet, you have a UUID, and you can create uh, different ports. So we, we want to build up such uh, like hierarchy architecture for this emulator too, uh, to to try to 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 better simulate the OpenStack behavior. Okay. Um, so, and then for the load balancer, uh, so the question is what load balancer is most fits into this framework? So it turns out we need to evaluate multiple open source load balancers. So is there a uh, layer four or are they layer seven or are they both support layer four and layer seven? Uh, like is that active uh, health check meaning they can sending the REST request to the backend and uh, analyze the response, like body or header, right? Um, or it's just passive. And how many load balancing algorithm it supports? 
And some other features like uh, how many protocols it support. How, uh, is that a, a high availability for the load balancer itself? And SSL offloading, things like that. So um, I want to, because uh, we have a, a, like every detail for the metrics in an Excel form, but here, because of limited page, I, I just want to give a brief uh, summary for, uh, for the uh, load balancers we ev uh, evaluated. So we evaluated uh, HA proxy, the Ninjax, the Pound load balancer, the Zen load balancer, and the LVS load balancer. Okay, so as you can see, maybe like uh, the first row is uh, are they support layer four and layer seven? So it turns out, for example, LVS only support layer four. So that's probably not a good load balancer because we really need layer seven uh, rerouting thing, right? Um, but so HA proxy uh, support layer four and layer seven. Ninjix support layer seven. So all rows are support. So that's very good. And uh, regarding to, uh, in terms of the routing algorithms, so um, turns out Pounds has only five algorithms supported. Um, HA proxy, Ninjax, uh, and other uh, low balancers, they have around 10 uh, low algorithm to support, which is good. And, and for Pound, for the health check, Pound are not supported deep health check at all. So which probably uh, not good balancer again. Uh, so um, HA proxy support uh, active sends the deep health check and uh, uh, the request and the analyze the response. Ninjax is be able to uh, send the request and analyze the um, response, but it needs you to pay for the commercial version. Uh, there are uh, some other metrics like uh, are they support HTTP, HTTPS, and IPv4, IPv6, things like that. And uh, then we have some low testing results. So basically, we generate uh, heavy traffic for each pieces of the framework. So we generate heavy traffic for open daylight node uh, to the load balancer and to the load balancer connecting to the open daylight. Uh, so again, I pick up some results here. Um, so first test case will be uh, we have 20,000 requests with one concurrency number. And then the second one will be 3,000 requests with 100 concurrency number. And the third is 3,000 requests with 300 concurrency number. Um, so if you look at the table here, you can see pretty much those three low balancer are, are the, their performance in terms of uh, rest request number per seconds. They almost like in a drop uh, fall into the same range. There is not a significant difference between like one to each other. Um, so we think okay. So from that uh, from that angle perspective, uh, they they are about the same. Okay. So. Then we have some conclusion here is HA proxy probably will be the most fit open source load balancer for our framework. The reason is because first, it support both layer four and layer seven. And the second is it support both uh, health check and deep health check. You can actively uh, send the uh, health check and it can analyze both the uh, response header and the body. Um, and uh, it has rich load balancing algorithms. It, high, it has a high performance in terms of requests per seconds, and it has a least field request uh, in average. So Ninjax is potentially an alternative one, but uh, it just needs to pay uh, for the commercial version to the health track features. Uh, and uh, both HA proxy and Ninjax supports multi-instance features, so potentially that means uh, you can have, it supports uh, the high availability for the load balancer itself. Um, I guess, um, so here is the link. Uh, so I, uh, I, as I said, I have a lot of more detail about the, uh, the metrics and the testing data in the uh, Google Excel form. And here is a GitHub for the emulator I wrote and some slides reference. And uh, acknowledgments, I just want to say special thanks for my mentor, Annual. Uh, I can't finish this project without his great help. Uh, thank you, Annual. Um, that's it.
Hello everyone, my name is uh, Kian Ha and I'm a core reviewer on the Jenkins Job Builder project. <laughs> so what is Jenkins? Jenkins is a continuous integration server that helps improve your productivity by building and testing your software projects. <laughs> Jenkins Job Builder, on the other hand, um, takes in simple descriptions of Jenkins jobs and uses it to configure Jenkins. <laughs> is easy to use and after this talk I hope I can impart you with knowledge on where to get started with JGP and what JGP can do for you. So creating a job in Jenkins uh, Job Builder is very simple. Uh, you can create a job by as shown where you write just dash job and the name of the job that you want uh, below it. This is in particular useful as it's currently doing nothing, but we can make it do something, such as publishing from a, a plugin. <coughs> so, <coughs> using uh, the robot plugin as my example, we can collect test results and publish them to the robot framework. In the following configuration, I called my job robot job and uh, the ro I configure a couple of options in the robot plugin. In particular, output path and other files. <laughs> so I'm just showing you here that uh, I created the robot job. <laughs> and inside this robot job, I've set a couple of options, but seemingly more uh, other options too. So some plugins have a lot of different uh, options that you can set. And what Jenkins Job Builder will do is uh, it will set you, it will set the default option or default value to the option if nothing is passed to, uh, to it. <laughs> to override these uh, these default values, simply add in the option's name and uh, set it to whatever you need it to be. So if you're defining multiple jobs that differ between, uh, that differ slightly between one job over the other, maybe one job has a slightly different name over one another or another job does an extra thing, does an extra thing, you can create a job template. For instance, you can create a job template that differs in name using the curly braces <laughs> and this will differ, for instance, you can create a job template that differs in the name using the curly braces to indicate that name is a variable. So in this example, I've created two job templates, one job called the robot job one and the other robot job two. They differ in name, uh, they not only differ in name, but uh, if you take notice, the robot job two also prints out to the shell, hello world. <laughs> Along with creating a job template, you will need to create uh, a project to use the job template. A project collects related jobs and provide the values to the variables in the job template that was made. <laughs> Many jobs can be defined using macros. A macro lets the user to easily call a frequently repeated task. This is useful as it is cleaner than re, uh, repeatedly rewriting the same code for the same task. So for example, uh, we can set up a macro, as you see in the first block of code, for the robot configuration that we have made in the previous uh, job, job configuration, and call the, the macro for the two job templates uh, instead. <coughs> As you can imagine, this, is, uh, this will help you keep the code uh, really s uh, simple and uh, small if you have a lot of job in the future. <laughs> Just a quick summary uh, for the TLDR. Keep uh, related jobs organized in uh, projects. Job templates help simplify similar jobs and macros are great for frequently repeated tasks. If you're interested in the Jenkins Job Builder, I provided the link, or you can do a quick Google search. Uh, Jenkins Job Builder, it should be the first link. <laughs> and that's my presentation. Thank you for listening. <laughs> so 
yeah hey everyone uh yeah hey everyone uh, i'm kumar uh so my project was J jb monitoring framework for open dli and my mentor was luis gomez uh so what's jb monitoring framework first of all so one liner uh, it's a collection of general purpose resources for harvesting and analyzing various matrices generated by odl controller now what uh, what can what kind of matrices can be generated by odl controller basically it can be any sort of object uh, uh, generated by either jmx server or something like a perf matrix uh, so the matrices that are currently supported are just the jmx mbeans and that to a limited set of it i'll come to that later the now once we have the framework then we can leverage it to write long duration slash short duration feature agnostic test for the ci ci infrastructure that we have uh, so uh, so we have very uh, small set of test right now but say a test could be something like a is some sort of sla that is getting honored during the course of time say for 24 hours during which the odl controller is running say something like if the garbage collector takes at any point of time more than 1 minute to complete that's uh, that's kind of a long time for any java application so something like that uh, the major components include decanter a sort of data store in which we dump all the data a general purpose library that we develop and a, a small canonical test of robert test suite uh, that we use to test it and obviously the script to configure and uh, glue it all together we also have support for plotting slash analyzing the matrices that we generate uh, matrices that we harvest also we have support for getting the real time data from the mbean server uh yeah so uh yeah the major components as i already said decanter uh, data now why do we use elastic search data store uh, uh short answer is because that is supported uh, that is the one that is supported uh, completely by the decanter community but it could be any other no sql solution because we have the objects which we need to dump into the some sort of data store but one plus point of elastic search index uh, elastic search reverse index is because it supports a very rich set of queries which is generally not supported by other no sql solutions but we do have cassandra that is getting uh, that is being developed uh, actively by the decanter community uh, then the configuration scripts for the entire decanter slash elastic search stack and the general purpose robot uh, slash python library uh so this is the high level view of what we tried to achieve so if you can see we have a cluster of controllers uh, at at the bottom which uh, each of them has an agent of decanter plus configuration script running which configure it which configure it to work as per our requirements uh, so we developed some template configuration scripts which we can use for uh, which we can use as per the use case that we have so say if you have a short duration test that is going to run say a 40 minutes duration test we have the scripts that can configure the uh, odl controller plus the data store as per the requirement which you can uh, which you can uh, inherit in the script plan uh, we'll come to that later and then we dump everything that we get into the data store above that we have the python keyword libraries now this has two interfaces one is the data store facing interface and one is the user facing interface uh, so the data store interface you can uh, you can uh, ask questions like okay uh, start the data collection into the data store or stop the data collection in the data store uh, then we have the user facing interface of it whereby user can ask it a uh, user in this case will be the robot keyword library uh that it that can ask okay aggregate the entire history that we collected from the start of the epoch that is the booting of the odl controller and then uh, on the top of that we developed a small set of robot keyword libraries that can be inherited into the existing robot frame uh, robot test we have in the integration test uh, uh, repository uh, so you can just in in into the start suite or tier suite of any test that you have in integration test you can just add a line like plot the data till now so it will plot the uh, entire data uh, data that is have for say a thread uh, thread matrix right now 
uh, we also have support for real time data uh, fetching so we can ask what was the latest the uh, latest thread count that we had or what was the latest garbage collector time that it took uh, for the entire garbage collection and then we go on to then we have support for generating the plots uh, so basically it leverages uh, some python plotting libraries to uh, develop the plots that we generate from uh, the data uh, data that we store so the major com components uh, so once we have the graph decanter uh, so short uh, short uh, short introduction uh, it's a monitoring solution maintained by the apache graph community it's used for collecting slash appending slash scheduling the jmx mb in matrices it has a support for rich set of regexes so i can ask something a uh, very simple question uh, actually it's not that simple if you go to pythonic regexes uh, so you can ask something like the object name should be java dot lang uh, whereby the type is something and then uh, the sub type is something else now in our case we use it to collect some very basic matrices like the class uses or the thread count or the memory object or the heap uses uh, actually it's not that small uh, so yeah we have a currently we have a pretty decent list of uh, objects that we support so we have heap support for heap memory uses or the non heap memory uses or uh, in the garbage collector we have the garbage collector thread uh, the thread count for the garbage collector uh, so actually uh, uh, so interesting story is someone used the framework and then came uh, then they they contacted us that uh, the total number of thread counts in odl controller uh, the out of box odl controller in jenkins Jenk uh, in the jenkins ci server used to go above 400 so we couldn't do anything about it but probably down the line someone will probably use it to uh, use it to miti mitigate the uh, mitigate the problems that they have then they then there is elastic search index uh, so if you have used elastic search index uh, uh, if you have uh, if you have used the queries in elastic search index to be uh, exact uh, those are like really really complex and just to say it's horrible to write all those queries so we use an object relation map, uh, an ORM wrapper over it to make the query simple for everyone and say if you want to add your own new data store you just uh, inherit from the uh, inherit from the data store class that we have in the python library and just uh, overwrite all those apis that uh, that are there in the elastic search index and then it should probably work out of box for uh, for other data stores too and obviously it works very well in multiple in um, multiple controller environment so basically it multicast in, in the entire lands uh, in the entire subnet that it has and uh, joins everyone uh, joins every uh, every elastic search index that it has so we don't need to provide anything uh, uh, offline uh, or hard code it just uh, discovers the entire topology online so that's a pretty uh, good uh, that's a pretty good plus for elastic search uh, so the python robot key slash robot keyword library that we wrote has two uh, interfaces the user facing and a data store facing interface so data store facing interface interacts with elastic search to retrieve slash search for the uh, objects uh, that are dumped into the elastic search index so there are three kinds of queries that we support currently first is the range query so we can ask something like okay get me all the heap memory uses for last 200 minutes or we have the partial partial queries or the point queries so for the point queries we can have something like asking for the real time data fetching that is get me the latest thread count or yeah something similar to that after that uh, yeah we obviously leverage the elastic search interface and dsl query wrapper to augment our search and we have the user facing interface that allows robot test suites to interact with the elastic search installation so we uh, it allows inter it allows the user to ask the framework question like okay let's start the data collection at some point of time later we stop the data collection and then we can perhaps generate the plot of it uh, yeah I, and i covered the robot test library so some plots that we generated uh, i can't show because 
so right now in the jenkins gate we have something around 50 tests that run uh, 50 tests that run this uh, uh, jvm monitoring framework that's less than 2% of the total tests we have in the uh, uh, jenkins framework but still uh, we are trying to uh, we are trying to increase the count and if you uh, if you want to integrate and if you come across any problems you can always contact me uh, so these are some these are some 24 hours plots that we generated so basically if you see during some so for, i'm not sure uh, what happened during this time but basically during this time uh, when you can see the spike it might mean that there was some test running which spiked uh, which uh, increased the cpu load a lot and then it became constant so probably someone can use it later uh, we also I, I can also show some plot in the uh, gates that we have uh, yeah so these are the three nodes clustered that we uh, on in which we generate uh, add, added the plot so basically it plots everything and then sends it to the logging servers uh, so let's see so these are uh, by the way these are very short duration tests we, but uh, you, uh, you can always write the 24 hour test later uh, so these are the kinds of plots that we generated out of it and if you see that uh, that graph thread uh, after and before basically someone uh, uh, someone added it later because uh, the uh, he saw in the uh, in the plots that the number of uh, threads that were uh, getting spawned was uh, a lot the, uh, more than the required um, yeah so yeah that's pretty much it uh, yeah Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Akshata Jha from IIIT Hyderabad. I was an open daylight intern for the summer. So I worked on a project on creating the Debian package for open daylight. My mentors were Daniel Farrell and Stephen Kitt. So I'll move on to how I worked on, like what I did in this project. So why do we need Debian packages? So for open daylight, RPMs already exist. Now, this is the pipeline that an RPM follows. So RPMs are consumed by Puppet and Ansible, which is then consumed by Packer, like Vagrant base, um, base boxes and uh, Docker containers. So there's no such pipeline. Because there was no dot .debs, there's no such pipeline that existed. Puppet Open Daylight used a tarball for Ubuntu-like OSs. So if we have debs, it will follow a similar pipeline. And it will be easier to maintain. And also, ODL upstream will provide installation options. So it's always better to have it in the upstream. Now, uh, the Debian package that I built is a very simplified packaging format. It is reproducible and automated. It provides service manager support, like systemd and uh, upstart. Also, it makes use of Jinja2 and uh, YAML templates. So it's basically for the open daylight are present or not to build the dot .deb package. If not, it basically downloads the dot tar dot zz file. If it's already present, it'll just ignore. And build Debian files dot py will build all the files that are needed for Debian packaging, making use of the templates again. So here we see that we have templates, change log template, the control template, and the rules template and all the other files. These files are made use of by build, like build Debian files .py makes use of these files. And uh, I showed you the YAML file, which has all the variables defined in it. Now to build a .deb package, this is a command that we run. We execute the script build.py with the arguments. This is the major version. This is for the Boron release the minor version, the patch version, and the .deb version that we want. Now, since I already had the .tar.gz file downloaded, it says already cached. This is what cached.py does. Then again, we I haven't included the entire screenshot, but yeah. So finally, in the end, we see that .deb is being built. 
and similarly for Ubuntu we can do the same for different versions of Ubuntu. Now Open Daylight comes with systemd integration. So systemd integration basically helps people to not actually touch the binaries in the bin folder. So we can just start Open Daylight using uh, system CTL start ODL and uh, when we see the status of Open Daylight, we see that it's active and it's running using just systemd. And uh, we can then SSH into the KRF shell and then run commands on the KRF shell. Now once this is done, if you want to just stop Open Daylight, you can again use systemd to just stop. You can check whether Open Daylight is active or not. It says it's active. Now I stop open daylight and then I see that the status is dead, inactive, right? So again, a Debian package we build, we install. Now how do we remove? So sudo apt get remove. We'll remove all the folders, all the files, open daylight files. And uh, sudo apt get purge will remove all the configuration files as well. So yeah, I think all of us do this very often. Now, after the build, there'll be a specialized directory called Open Daylight, which again contains specialized directory for the particular Open Daylight version. So we have, say, a dot dev for uh, Boron release that is 5001. So these are the direct. Uh, this is the directory structure inside Open Daylight, and inside the specialized directory, again, we have Debian the Debian directory, which basically contains, yeah, which basically contains these files. So these files have been generated using the templates that I showed earlier. So it will be different for different releases of Open Daylight. Uh, now, once the .deb has been built, we'll now install Open Daylight. Now, how do we do that? We'll use, uh, if we built it in our local machine, we can use sudo gdebye uh, to install open daylight along with all its dependencies and here we see that uh, it's being installed also if we don't want to build it locally it's been hosted on the open source website build services so uh, for debian uh, for debian 8.0 we can just add the repository and install it, app get install. Dynamic, we can build dot .debs for any of the open daylight versions that are available. I can just show you what the VARS file looks like. Yeah. So uh, this is the VARS file, YAML file. So here we have the version, major version, the minor version, the patch version. So these are the variables that are used that can be used to build a dynamic .deb package. And uh, uh, this .deb package handles all the dependencies. So say for Boron, the dependency is Java 8. It will be automatically included in that. For Beryllium is Java 7. It will again be included in it. So we don't need to install Java 8 and Java 7 separately. Uh, this is the GitHub repo where uh, the code has been hosted. It's in Open Daylight integration packaging. There's a dev folder where we can find the code. Now, uh, this is the directory structure of the entire Debian packaging. So we have a build.py script that uses cache.py and build Debian files.py. Now, cache.py uses YAML templates and uh, decides if all the artifacts that are needed